Mary Klotman, uh, the Dean of the Medical School, who, uh, as it turns out, is also an infectious disease physician by training. So she is extremely well positioned to tell us uh, today about uh, the, the coronavirus or the source of uh, the ideological agent for COVID-19 uh, and its impact on uh, humans. So Mary, maybe you can tell us just a little bit about generally what kind of virus is this and you know how is it spread? Well, as you mentioned, it is a coronavirus and coronaviruses can be anything from a mild respiratory virus that nobody ever knew they had to actually being an acutely fatal um, virus, which was the original SARS and then MERS. Um, so actually it's a, it's a very uh, mixed group of viruses. There are RNA viruses um, for what that is worth um, uh, and they are spread fairly easily through certainly respiratory secretions. Um, but what happens after you get a virus is very different depending on which coronavirus it is. So in the case of, uh, of this uh, particular virus, um, what are the kind of symptoms people are seeing? Well, originally we thought it was, you know, the flu-like symptoms. Um, so fever, cough, muscle aches. But what we've been, we've been becoming more and more apparent over time is the spectrum of symptoms and frankly, no symptoms um, is quite broad. And so added to the list now is certainly kind of an interesting uh, presentation of lo loss of taste and smell, um, which is quite unique. But then you go into common uh, upper respiratory cold symptoms uh, that look as uh, looks like uh, seasonal uh, allergies. So unfortunately, I would say that the breadth of symptoms now being associated with this virus are quite broad, which makes it uh, that the, the clinical syndrome can be less specific, which is really why you need a very specific test. So how about things like that, the kind of strange outline things people are seeing like stroke and you know, there seems to be some vascular component here. Yeah, so there is a myriad of complications that occur particularly in those that are hospitalized and very sick. You know, and I think originally it was thought, well, that's part of being um, uh, very sick uh, with lots of complications that occur in the hospital. But it does appear that some of these symptoms, like a hypercoag state um, that can manifest itself as a stroke or, um, you know, vascular th thrombotic events elsewhere, do seem to be part of the syndrome. There appears to be some sort of a cardiomyopathy. Um, also, interestingly, there's a very high incidence of renal complications, uh, acute renal failure. Um, that's an area of interest to me because I've studied that in HIV. I think many of these syndromes are related to the virus as opposed to being just an overwhelmingly sick individual, but that's where a lot of the work still needs to be done. And presumably some of it can be overreact, some immune system response to the virus. Yeah, so that's the other really interesting part that makes this different from a respiratory virus. So there are the symptoms associated with the, with the involvement of the, the lungs and the upper respiratory tract, but then there's this inflammatory response um, that doesn't happen in everybody, but really does create a whole other layer of complications. It's the the host response to the virus as opposed directly from the virus itself. Mm -hmm. Now, people are talking about uh, asymptomatic spread and uh, maybe you can sort of distinguish pe from, for people sort of asymptomatic versus pre-symptomatic and what the, what the um, implications are for um, uh, viral load, viral spread, et cetera. Sure. You know, I think one of the most troubling parts of what we've learned the last uh, few months is there is a period of time in which individuals have no symptoms, but they're infectious, they're contagious, they can spread the virus. In some individuals, they never get symptoms. What percentage that is, it depends on your age, it, it depends on the uh, presence of other comorbidities. Um, but even if eventually you get symptoms, there are several days before that you are infectious. And that makes this an infection control nightmare. Mm -hmm. And that really is why the, the uh, universal recommendations of masking, distancing, and washing hands are so critical um, because we don't know who's infected. And I think, unfortunately, short of testing, there's probably not gonna be any other way to know that, that uh, 30, 40% of people, and again, it depends on the age too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And, you know, there's been some talk about uh, really what the, what's the incubation period for the virus? What is the appropriate time of quarantine? What is sort of the, th the current thinking of the, about this? Well, like everything about COVID, it's changing rapidly. Um, you know, after exposure, probably incubation period is a couple of days, but it can be potentially as long as 10 to 14 days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that's an outlier. So, so generally, we think a couple of days to a week. But that does determine issues of how long you stay quarantined after you think you've been exposed. Um, but as of this week, uh, CDC has revised some of their guidelines and feel very fairly comfortable in recommending um, you know, a 10-day uh, window. Uh, because what we do know over time, even, uh, even if you've gotten the virus, that over time, your infectivity to another individual goes down. Mm -hmm. And the way that we know that is in some smaller studies, they've just looked at people's secretions daily after they they um, test positive, and the ability of the, the secretion to actually contain infectious virus goes down over time. So even if, let's say, at 12 days, you're PCR positive, it's highly unlikely if you're a normal host that you're gonna have infectious replication competent virus. And so the CDC has modified their guidelines, shortening the period of quarantining um, and their recommendations. It seems uh, two other things about this virus that at least have struck me from looking in the news. One is a sort of bi, you can have a sort of biphasic illness where people think they're fine and then there's sort of a pretty precipitous decline, but also to what you were saying about PCR positivity, there are people who a long time after they've recovered are seem to still be PCR positive. Yeah, so I, we'll talk about that first because I, I think from a virology standpoint, that's pretty interesting. In a disease like HIV, we've known for a very long time that a lot of the nucleic acid is that you can find by PCR in individuals does not represent complete viral genomes and so cannot create a virus that then can go through a virus life cycle. PCR doesn't distinguish that. So PCR just tells you, is there viral RNA there? Doesn't tell you anything about, is it a full viral genome? And it is a, is it a replication competent viral genome? So yes, uh, and PCR is extraordinarily sensitive. Mm -hmm. So it is not surprising that individuals that have had this virus could have viral RNA detectable for a significantly long period of time. But as I said, that doesn't mean they're infectious. And more and more studies are showing is they're likely not after that certain period of time. Um, but it, it just complicates our ability to know who's infectious and who is. Yep. And in terms of the, the course of the illness then, presumably people, when they get sick, they have to be very alert to, yeah, well, you know, that biphasic, again, is interesting and, you know, I hate to say fascinating um, because if you have the virus, it's a nightmare. But um, I think the first phase is virus replication. The second phase is the robust immune response to the virus that in some individuals is way off the charts, mm -hmm. way off the charts with measurements of inflammation that we rarely see. Uh, much more indicative of a real inflammatory disease as opposed to an infectious disease. That tends to signal that second uh, phase of illness. Uh, and in between, there are, you know, a couple of days where people feel like I've got I've beaten this thing, right? Um, which is right. a little discouraging. Yeah, and I, you know that that points to the use of steroids, et cetera, in some settings. Well, absolutely right. You know, and you know the good news. Um, there always has to be good news is some of uh, the increasing information has informed therapy that is effective. So steroids are a great example. We now know in severely ill individuals that are not intubated, steroids make a very big difference. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that play out now. If you look in Duke Hospital, although we do have a lot of hospitalized patients, the percentage ending up in the ICU is smaller. I mm -hmm. think it's because of the age difference, but also because we now know to give patients steroids, we have remdesivir, we've learned a lot just how to give the best supportive care. And so I, I think that really has changed the outcome for some individuals. No, that's important. 
So finally, maybe you can make a, a little, you know, give a little comment. You've referred to vulnerable populations or demographics. Maybe you can say a little bit about um, pre-existing conditions, about, you know, comorbidities, really uh, what the picture is that's emerging, and also maybe make a, a comment or two about what people are thinking about uh, in terms of children and disease yeah. transmission. So certainly pre-existing pre conditions um, definitely uh, will lead to a worse outcome. And now I think study after study have shown obesity, hypertension, diabetes, not surprising pre-existing uh, pulmonary disease and pre-existing cardiovascular disease. We also know age is a factor. And in fact, um, once you hit around 60, it's only almost a linear increase in morbidity and mortality with age. So those are the big risk factors. That does not mean that people under 60 without any of the comorbidities are not gonna get sick. And I think that has been an unfortunate um, conclusion that particularly young people have taken. Occasionally, you'll have a young, healthy individual that unfortunately not only gets sick but dies. Now, is that because they have some genetic predisposition to the inflammatory um, aspect? I don't know, um, but it is true that the increasing um, morbidity mortality is generally related to those comorbidities. For children, it's a really interesting and challenging situation. The good news is children generally do not get sick. There is a unusual and very scary inflammatory um, picture in a small number of children, like how, and it looks like what we call Kawasaki's disease. That's, fortunately, that's a very small number. Children do get infected. Um, so by and large, they're asymptomatic. And some of the data is suggesting that um, the younger infected children are not as likely to spread the virus, but as they get into their teenage years, they can certainly spread the virus. Mm -hmm. So they are kind of vectors uh, in some sense. Right. They're, uh, unfortunately, they often uh, live with individuals that have those comorbidities. And that's, that's the challenge with uh, you know, the issue of opening schools. Yes. It's not as much the fear of um, sickness in uh, significant numbers of kids, although we would all agree sickness in one kid is too much, but it's also that issue of spread to individuals um, at risk. So it's complex and these decisions are, are tough ones. Yeah, and, and it, as, as the virus uh, sort of spreads through the population, as you said, our knowledge of the virus is, is evolving. So Yeah, you know, and then again, that's great, but it makes communication about the virus very yeah. challenging. Yes. You know, I, I still hear about, well, you know, Tony Fauci and infectious disease experts did not recommend masks in the beginning. Right, right. Well, that is true, and there's lots of reasons why that was. That is no longer the case. The data right. clearly shows masks work, but it's really hard to, to have that continuing changing uh, stream of information uh, and really explain that in a way that it makes sense. And I, I, that's a challenge. That's right. I mean, I, I, you know, you think about things that evolved over a much uh, slower period of time. People now wouldn't say, I'm not going to take an antibiotic for an ulcer because I always heard that it came from spicy food. You know, like, <laughs> you <laughs> good know. Anal good analogy. I mean, the good news is the amount of information that we have accumulated on this virus in literally six months is extraordinary. Yes. And yeah. to see what that has done in terms of just how we treat patients, but the pace of science, um, frankly, where we are with a potential vaccine, uh, yeah. new antivirals. I'm so thrilled that Duke is now a site for the national testing of vaccines and antivirals because this pipeline is going to really evolve very fast. And the fact that we can offer our patients and our community uh, participation in these kinds of important studies, I think is critical. No, it's fantastic. Uh, you know, you, as you were saying, you, when you find a case interesting, it, it's actually a human being. I think as scientists, yeah. we find the science exciting, not at the expense of, you know, human life, et cetera. But I think just stepping back as a scientist, it is quite impressive how much uh, the scientific community has learned in such a short time. And 
the potential impact uh, on treatment. No, absolutely. And, you know, I would say it's because we build infrastructures and technology and have developed scientists that we can actually work at this pace that's so extraordinary. No, that's right. That's right. And uh, we always, as basic, you know, when you think about basic science, I always have to put in the plug for this. It's, it's all our years of understanding of basic virology that help enable this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think of, you know, when you look at the HIV evolution, it was 100% fatal to a completely treatable disease in 25 years. We're compressing. Exactly. The, and that you know, was on decades of retroviral research in yeah. animals. Before and that was seen know. as extraordinary. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but we don't have that vaccine yet. But, you know, well, this is six months. So, you know, again, the silver lining is I think the science is moving very, very rapidly. Yes. Um, certainly not fast enough for, for those that have unfortunately gotten infected, um, but enough to inform us on what we need to be doing right now. No, exactly. Well, thanks very much, Mary. I really appreciate it. And I know that uh, our uh, members of the community that will hear this uh, will learn more about the virus. And I think that's important both to understand what you've said, but also to understand the fact that this still is a moving target. And so um, to stay alert to changing public health recommendations uh, and uh, other preventative me measures. Well, so, my pleasure. And I think one of the things we'd like to continue to do is, is keep updating our community on the science so that they can really understand when recommendations change. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sally. Take care.